Hi everyone, my name is Lizette Bakrami and you might know me as Technozet from Twitter or from the website I own, which is technozet.com. So I've been working in law enforcement for 10 years now, but before I joined law enforcement, I was actually a primary school teacher. Probably that's where my love comes from, from sharing everything about the field that I love so much, which is OSINT. So next to the fact that I work at law enforcement, I also like to blog on OSINT Curious, for example, to share all of the expertise I know, but also teach at my OSINT training or teach private courses for whoever is interested. So working in law enforcement for over 10 years now, I've mostly worked in a serious and organized crime divisions where I've done tons of stuff using OSINT in my field of work. For example, geolocating a photograph we find in uh, any kind of evidence, but also looking at social media side or SOCMIN so-called, which is something I really love. This has to do probably with the fact that I used to work at a social media website, which was very popular in the Netherlands, but currently isn't existing anymore. I was one of the content managers there and one of the things I did was having contact with law enforcement. So whenever they would send a subpoena to me, I would reply. And that's where they lured me into the law enforcement field um, because they knew I had a good background with internet and social media and they thought it could be of value within the police. And I can admit that I never regret one single day working there. It's amazing. And I can really recommend a job in law enforcement. So OSINT within law enforcement, um, there can be a difference when looking at different countries. So my reference is the Dutch police. So I can explain you a little bit of how things work with OSINT within the Dutch police. So the Dutch police is basically divided in two sections. So we have an intel side and we have an, have an investigative side. I am mainly on the investigative side. On the intelligence side, one of the things we do is looking at what's going on in the world. Uh, for example, is there going to be a demonstration against the government? And things people are doing there using OSINT are answering questions like, how many people are about to turn up? Do we think there's going to be a use of violence against law enforcement? Or are there going to be specific groups which maybe come together and they will end up fighting, for example? So they mainly uh, answer very broad questions. When we look at the investigative side, we're looking at exact answers. For example, questions like, can we use OSINT to determine where somebody's currently living? Or can we search online to find information where he went to on his last holiday? Or can we find out who he's currently in a relationship with? All of this has a difference when we're looking at a normal person doing this versus somebody in law enforcement. So a normal people, normal people like civilians are of course allowed to use the internet and find out stuff about, for example, who they're dating or who's the new neighbor they just moved into next door. But within law enforcement, it's a little bit different. I'm, again, I'm not quite sure how it is everywhere in the world, but in the Netherlands, we have law we need to abide to. So whenever we want to do an investigating, uh, investigating on somebody specifically, we of course need specific permission in order to, for some, I'm not quite sure how to phrase it, but to break into somebody's privacy. So we have to find out a lot of stuff about somebody. And of course, we're not allowed to just do that without any kind of permission. We do need specific permission from our public prosecutor who in the Netherlands is the lead and, and responsible for every investigation. So the difference between doing investigative or OSINT work as a civilian versus that as law enforcement is that within law enforcement, we need to follow the rules in order to make sure we respect everybody's privacy. So I learned most of the OSINT skills I have by doing stuff and by being curious. So 10 years ago, OSINT wasn't such a big thing. Even worse, before I started in law enforcement, I didn't even know OSINT was a thing. I think it was probably a year or so that I was in law enforcement that I first heard the term OSINT. And this was at a OSINT training. So within my first year, we had a full week of OSINT training 
where we didn't even went very deep in, for example, how to search on Google. We focused a lot on how websites were hosted and where to find information like from who is and such. So getting into deep, like how to search on Google, for example, I learned tons about being on Twitter. So I immediately found out that Twitter was probably the best source for me to get information about this field of work. So I started following a, a lot of people, especially the hashtag OSINT was very interesting. And by learning to do stuff and to be persistent, so to not give up very easily when I couldn't find something, really helped me develop my skills. And it's also a lot of like, would it be possible to find this kind of information using Google to find something on Facebook, for example, and figuring out what would be, for example, a, uh, a, a search operator to use to find that information. Or when I was, for example, on Instagram, I use it on my private, uh, for a private account too. And I noticed a couple of features it had, for example, tagging people into photos. And I was wondering, can I see that information of, of other people too? And by being that curious and persistent to find that information, that's probably how I developed most of my skills. So in my whole career of 10 years, I also only had two OSINT trainings, one in the beginning. And later on in my career, I had the Sun Sense class 487, which is currently now the 497, I believe. Um, but yeah, those are the two I took. But all of the skills, be persistent, be curious, and don't give up easily. So one of the great stories that always stood by me was when I was working in law enforcement, this was in my third or fourth year of my career, we got a notification from Interpol asking for a welfare check. So this was a foreign girl that had uh, flown to the Netherlands even though she was uh, older than 18, so she wasn't a minor, her parents were very afraid that she would be uh, ended up in human trafficking circle or maybe as a prostitute. This girl had very uh, heavy uh, mental issues. She had medication and she told her parents that a Dutch guy bought her plane ticket and that she was going to the Netherlands and she didn't get a return ticket. So her parents were very afraid. So I was reading this and I was thinking about, wow, what are the chances that people on the streets, like law enforcement in uniforms, like the emergency care on the streets will bump into this girl asking, are you okay? So I thought there must be a reason, like an, another way to find out information about her. So of course I started with Google searching for this girl I found quickly her Facebook page that didn't contain a lot of information, but it did say she was going to the Netherlands, but she didn't specify where. Then quickly after I found her Instagram page and on her Instagram page, um, I could see she was from a warmer area in the world. And suddenly there were three photos with quite a gray sky, which is common in the Netherlands, gray skies and rain. And I was thinking to myself, this must be the Netherlands. And she actually commented with the photo saying, well, this is where I'm currently staying. And on the photo, there were a couple of items of interest where I thought I must be able to geolocate this. So I saw a bus. I saw a little stream of water. There was a small like soccer slash basketball field. There were some trees, some buildings, and there was this weird looking... I thought it was like um, um, something from a synagogue, maybe like a or a church. And I started pivoting to see where this girl could have been. And because I had a hunch it might be in two places in the Netherlands and I saw the bus on the photo, I just Googled to see where does this bus line come from? So from the two towns I had, only one stayed because that was the only town where this specific bus company, company was riding the public transport. So I looked up to see how many bus lines there were in that particular city, and there were five bus lines. So I followed each and every bus line on Google Maps to see whenever the bus would move over the water to get myself there with Google Street View to see if the surroundings would match with the photo I saw on Instagram. 
So it was the first bus line, luckily. Uh, and it was about the third time it passed the water that I put myself with Street View. And I was like, oh, this is the place. I'm looking at the exact same basketball courts. The church is in the corner too. This must be the location. So then I used our internal police systems to see whoever was living in this particular building. I quickly found out that his name was kind of matching the name the parents gave in the Interpol welfare check. So I thought, well, if we have to start something where, we have to start there. So I phoned up the local police department there, explaining them about the Interpol welfare check. They saw it too. And I told them that I thought she might be staying at this particular address. So they did the welfare check. They rang the doorbell. The boy opened. And he immediately was very afraid. He was like, what's going on? So they told them, well, we're here for the welfare check of the girl. We just wanted to know if she's okay. And she came to the door and they were actually madly in love with each other. And he was a very decent, very kind boy. Um, but the parents were very satisfied to hear that the police did the welfare check. And I truly believe that if I've never searched for the girl online to see where she might have been or the photos she's shared so far, I would probably, she would probably never be checked by police because she would be just one face in a million of faces people see every day. So she probably wouldn't stand out. So I was very happy to give her parents some relief and knowing she was all right. Another great story is um, an abduction case. So a man was abducted and when he was uh, released again, he uh, explained to the police that during the whole time he was blindfolded. So he didn't get a sense of where he was. But he had a great memory when it came to noises. So he told all kinds of things to the police saying, well, I was held in this particular area. It had this particular metal roof because it rained one day and I really heard it very loudly, like you're just below a metal roof. He could explain all kinds of noises, like he heard two kind of church bells. He counted the seconds between the first and the second church bell to estimate how long apart they were. And he could say, well, they're a full minute apart. And he could also tell, well, on Sunday, they had a longer tune because because of the church bells, he was very able to keep well, well good of track of time because he knew that if it would ring one time, it was one o'clock. So all of the information he gave, I started plotting out on a Google Earth map. And getting all of the details in there, we determined the search area of the region where he was probably held captive. And I made a list of all of the buildings of interests and we sent out our police cars to check those buildings. And we eventually ended up finding that one particular building. And in the end, I was curious to know like, would have there been any other way we would have had ended up at that particular location but we searched all of the evidence we had for that particular address and nothing showed up and the original plan of the investigative team by hearing this guy's statement was by just driving around in their car asking people if they would knew such and such a building and in my head, that's what, that was so weird because this guy had so many details about the roof. You cannot see the roof from the ground, but we can see the roof from satellite imagery. So that was my focus point to go on. And I was pretty proud that they eventually found the location where he was held captive. If you want to get into the ocean fields, there are a couple of suggestions I have for you to start with. So first of all, let's start with all of the free options, because of course there are tons of trainings to follow, but they can be expensive. There are also good, good affordable uh, trainings out there, but some of them are quite expensive. So let's start with the free part. So if you want to get into the ocean fields and just have some good things to read, I'll probably suggest going on Twitter. I know with the whole Elon Musk thing, Twitter might be seems unstable to you, but the OSINT community is still out there. 
searching by the hashtag, uh, hashtag OSINT, you can find tons of people, articles, uh, cool YouTube videos to watch to see if that can help you develop a kind of interest because OSINT is a very broad field. So maybe you find that your specialty lies within geolocation. So finding an image or a photo to an exact definite location. Or maybe you like the Sockmint version more, like doing social media investigations, for example. So going on Twitter, you can see what maybe is within your part of interests. If you're not so much a fan of Twitter, you can also go to the Ocean Curious Discord. So there are tons of channels to go into to find information about specific kinds of fields of oceans. Of course, if you're more into reading, oceancurious.com, you can find tons of blogs on techniques where we explain it to you in a very simple manner. So you can immediately adjust this within your work or maybe in your free time, of course. And next to the OSINT Curious blog, OSINT Curious also has done a couple of 10 minute videos. So on YouTube, there's tons of stuff to find out about OSINT. There are a couple of trainings even of four hours or more that you can follow online. I can recommend, for example, uh, looking for the hashtag OSINT at home, where you can find vin videos of a Ben Doe Brown or Benjamin Strick. He has some great videos of high quality where he explains certain OSINT, mostly geolocating techniques to you, which are very interesting to watch. All of these are free, for example, to... Oh, all of these are free to watch, which is great. If you have a little bit of money to be spending on, I can definitely recommend going to a training. So go to a basic training at first, where they just teach you the basics, like how to search in Google, how to search in social media platforms, what ethics to use, how to do the intelligence when you've gathered all of the information. I can say that there are tons of stuff to go, at, to go and have a look at, but it's depending probably on the country where you live in, if there are quality trainings available. SANS, for example, is one that's available worldwide, and there are a couple of others as well, like, for example, my OSINT training or the trainings that Michael Bazell offers. These are all video trainings, which you can follow online. Um, but definitely take a look in your country to see if there are any companies offering any OSINT trainings. Of course, if you found something and you're asking yourself it might be worth the money to go there, Get yourself on Twitter or on Discord and ask this question to maybe OSINT experts living in your country or OSINT experts that are internationally known that might know more about the course you want to take. And they can maybe advise you if it's worth the money.